when someone comes with really chronic bubbly anything thing that you strategically think apart from decreasing inflammation is the other really big one like immediately i'm like hi everybody welcome to the kidney coach youtube channel i'm naturopathic dr fiona chin co-founder of the kidney disease solution and co-author i should say and co-founder of kygenesis which is our supplements that support the program and i am joined again today by the amazing jesse anna seville right. so I'm going to hand it across to you to first maybe let's cover what it is what it means why does it happen why does our urine get bubbly does it definitively mean we have kidney disease okay good question that was a common question that comes up and it's really important to know symptoms of kidney disease because outside of labs symptoms can be a good marker of what's working and not working mm -hmm. so one of the symptoms of kidney disease is bubbles in the urine or foamy urine but you know, foamy urine or bubbles in the urine is a sign that you are spilling protein. But mm. one of the things, the main thing is usually you're spilling some sort of protein. So I always like to say you have leaky kidneys. We talk about leaky gut. You can also get kind of leaky kidneys where uh, the mechanism of filtration is altered because of inflammation, because of the disease process. And because of that, you have protein that should not be getting into your urine, getting into your urine. And when you pee, that ends up creating bubbles and, you know, different people at different stages. This is a sign that many, many people are familiar with. And when you have a patient come in with foamy urine being, let's say one of their key features, how do you tackle that as a renal dietitian? What changes and, and what success maybe have you seen with whatever it is that you implement for that? Yeah, so if I if I see a patient that has uh, foamy urine, I'm not so much going to like zero in on like, let's solve the foamy urine, right? Mm -hmm. That would be short-sighted. That would not be working from like a comprehensive like, let's actually solve the real problem. Yeah. But I would be paying attention to it because when we start making changes, and I'll give an example here in a, in a minute, it's actually one of the first things that my patients will comment on that they see changes. Fascinating. Because you start making dietary changes and you're not going to get labs like a week later, you're not going to get labs two weeks later, four weeks later, but you'll get lab, but you'll see things, right? And you'll see and you'll notice how your body feels. So just an example of this. So we had a, we work with a lot of patients that are later stage, right? The GFR is less than 15. They want to get to transplant. And so they're holding onto their kidney function as long as possible. So we had a, a young man come in and uh, he really wanted to, uh, to get to transplant and not go on dialysis. Mm -hmm. uh, him and his wife, I think had, had just had a baby, like young couple. And but he was following, excuse me, a kind of a low protein vegan approach. And, uh, but was still seeing this decline, a lot of foamy urine. And we said, okay, well, what you can try is doing a very low protein diet with keto analog, which is a very aggressive nutrition approach mm. that you can use in those later stages. We use it, you know, a good bit for our people that have very late stage kidney disease. So, he started following this approach and he wasn't doing nothing before. Like he actually had a really, really great nutrition plan already. He'd already worked with the dietitian, came in to us to kind of hone it a little bit more. But what he noticed first off, when he brought his protein down to that, that really, really low amount and added in the keto analogs, you never want to drop your protein super low without having some sort of amino acid support, like a keto analog. Yeah. He noticed that the, the foam in his urine and the protein in his urine uh, decreased significantly enough that he noticed. Wow. It, it was a really, really big change for him. And for him, this was a good approach. He was able to hold his function in that like nine, 10 range for almost a year and a half until he was able to get a transplant and he skipped the whole dialysis experience. Apart from um, therapeutic nutritional interventions like keto analogs, minimizing protein. And I know I can talk about some herbs in a minute, but is there anything else that you know that you would implement or think about when someone comes with really chronic bubbly urine that's, you know, maybe the maybe one of the major symptoms that they have? Is there anything that you strategically think apart from decreasing protein, any other nutrients or anything that you deploy in that scenario? 
Yeah. So I, there's three, right? Three that like my brain goes to immediately. And this will segue into a little bit talking about the herbs. So when I think foamy urine, I think where are we at with protein? Mm -hmm. Where are we at with, um, where are we at with inflammation is the other really big one. Like immediately I'm like, what's, what's going on with inflammation. And then I say, where are we at with like, uh, getting this filtration mechanism to be working a little bit better. Mm. That's not a very concise way to say it. No, I think it is. It's good. But, yeah. but the reason I think about those three separately, number one is like okay, proteins, a low hanging fruit. If you're eating steak every day, like let's just, let's just talk about the dietary composition and protein is controversial. It's controversial in the kidney disease world. I will acknowledge that. But to me, after working with hundreds of patients, we just know it is an easy opportunity to start mm -hmm. to just tackle getting the protein at the right level and the right type of protein. Then I know inflammation is going to make this kind of leaky kidney, especially if I'm dealing with autoimmune disease or nephrotic syndrome and kidney disease, then I'm really thinking like, wow, what is driving this inflammatory response? And now I'm starting to put on my root cause hat. And then the next thing I'm thinking, okay, what else can we do? Okay. So we take care of inflammation, but then the next piece, this world, you know, I want to start thinking about the herbs. I'm like, can, do we have any tools that we can put in place that's going to help, you know, help us reduce that proteinuria, anything that's, you know, beyond just like overall systemic inflammation, that's a big picture, but are there more acute inflammation measures that we can tackle with herbs, right? That we can tackle with herbs <clears throat> or with other uh, nutritional supplements. Jessiana, thank you. Make sure you hit subscribe and uh, like the video. That means you'll get flagged anytime we put up new content. And if there's anything in particular that you want Jesse and Anna, Jesse, Anna and I to discuss, make sure you dump it in the comments below and I can flag her so she can get her research brain on and have a look. So, again, thanks for being part of our community. Jessiana, thank you again for your time, knowledge, and expertise. I'm always grateful you. for you. And we'll speak to you all later. Bye. Okay. Sounds good. Bye-bye.